All right, good afternoon and welcome. So I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Chad Williams. Uh, Professor Williams is the Samuel J. and Augusta Specter Professor of History and African and African American Studies at Brandeis University. His first book, Torchbearers of Democracy, African American Soldiers in the World War I Era, has been widely praised as a landmark study and has won numerous accolades, including the 2011 Liberty Legacy Foundation Award from the Organization of American Histories. Professor Williams' work explores Du Bois's complex relationship with the history and legacy of World War I and what it reveals about the struggle for democracy, racial justice, and peace in the 20th century. He has published articles and book reviews in numerous leading academic journals and collections, and his op-eds and essays have been featured in The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Time Magazine, and The Conversation. His next book, The Wounded World, W.E.B. Du Bois and World War I, is under contract with Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. And it's coming out when expected publication? April. Wonderful. And I first had the pleasure of meeting... Uh, Chad Williams virtually about two years ago when we went head-to-head -head in a light-hearted but lively Zoom debate for the 100-year Retroactive Book Award, where we each made our case for the best book published in 1920. I argued for Edith Wharton's The Age of Innocence, <laughs> while Chad made the case, the winning case, I might add, for Du Bois's Dark Water, Voices from Within the Veil. So please join me in welcoming Professor Chad Williams to the mouth. Thank you so much, and please don't hold it against me that uh, Du Bois won that contest. Um, I'm sure he was a big Edith Wharton fan, though. <laughs> um, it's a great pleasure to be here this afternoon. Thank you for coming out. Uh, I want to thank Patricia Penn for all of your uh, hospitality, organizing uh, my, my visit. I'm really looking forward to the talk this afternoon as well as uh, tomorrow morning. So I'm just going to get right into it. And this afternoon, I want to tell a story. It's a story about war and the challenges of being African American. It's a story about race and democracy, about history and memory. It's a story about hope, disillusionment, faith, and tragedy, determination, and failure. It's a story that spans more than two decades, from one world war to the next, and features as its central character arguably the most significant black intellectual in American history. But it may be helpful first for you to, if I take you back a moment, in October of 2000, a young graduate student just embarking on research for a dissertation on African American soldiers in World War I is at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. The papers of W.E.B. Du Bois are housed in the library's special collections department. This graduate student had very responsibly, in advance, gone through the finding aid and saw a reference to Du Bois' World War I materials. He was very intrigued. He goes to the library. He asks the archivist to see this collection. He's expecting maybe a few folders, even a whole box, if he's lucky. Instead, the archivist returns with six microfilm reels. Okay, what could this possibly be? So he loads the reel, turns the machine. I'm still old enough to know what microfilm was and how to, how to use a microfilm reader. Slowly forwards the film to the first frame, and this is what he saw. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm the graduate student. <laughs> And what I was looking at was the table of contents of an unfinished and unpublished manuscript by W.E.B. Du Bois on the black experience in World War I. This was followed by the actual manuscript, along with all of Du Bois's research materials and correspondence related to the project. Needless to say, I was shocked, thrilled, and completely overwhelmed. As I began to immerse myself in this archive and learn more about it, I realized that it was not completely unknown. It was, after all, a microfilm copy 
with the original materials located at Fisk University in Tennessee. Some Du Bois scholars had mentioned it in their works, with a few even exploring its significance to some extent. But most people, when I tell them of Du Bois' unpublished manuscript, are just as surprised as I was that day in October of 2000. Now, why this is the case, given all that has been written about Du Bois, would be a fascinating story to tell. Also, as you can probably imagine, just by looking at this table of contents, the manuscript itself is completely fascinating. Piecing the manuscript together, analyzing it, would perhaps make for another fascinating project. But I'm also interested in the story behind this book. What happened? Why did Du Bois write it? What was it actually about? Why did he spend so much time working on it? Why did it ultimately remain incomplete and unpublished? Why is it even important? So as best as I can in the next 35, 40 minutes or so, let me try and tell you the story based on my forthcoming book, shameless plug, out in April, available for pre-order now. <laughs> the story of the wounded world, W.B. Du Bois and the First World War. From the branches of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People to W.E. Burkhardt Du Bois, writer, scholar, seer, on his 50th birthday, February 23rd, 1918, given an affectionate appreciation of his great gifts and gratitude for the consecration of these gifts to the service of his race. So read the inscription on the silver cup presented to Du Bois at a Civic Club Gala in New York City, celebrating his half century of life. Born on February 23rd, 1868, in nearby Great Barrington, Massachusetts, to Mary Sylvina, Du Bois, in his mind and heart, was destined to serve his race. A young prodigy throughout grade school, he attended and graduated from Fisk University before moving back to Massachusetts where he earned a second undergraduate degree from Harvard University. He stayed at Harvard to pursue a doctorate in history, briefly interrupted by two transformative years at the University of Berlin. I believe if you squint really hard, you might be able to make out Du Bois think in the back row there. <laughs> in 1895, he completed his dissertation, The Suppression of the African Slave Trade in America, and became the first African American to obtain a PhD from Harvard. He would quickly establish himself as black America's foremost scholar and interrogator of what was at the time called the race problem. In 1903, he published what is widely considered the most important book in the history of African American letters, the genre defined classic, The Souls of Black Folk. I always tell my students I'm not going to let them graduate if they have not read The Souls of Black Folk by their senior year. Du Bois also helped lay the groundwork for what we now commonly recognize as the modern civil rights movement. In 1905, he co-founded the Niagara Movement to challenge the accommodationist program of Booker T. Washington, and in 1909, helped co-found the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, where he served as editor of its magazine, The Crisis. On the eve of the First World War, in terms of intellect and influence, Du Bois had few rivals. Du Bois closely followed the World War from the opening guns of August 1914. Yet in a very real sense, Africa is a prime cause of this terrible overturning of civilization which we have lived to see. He wrote in his landmark 1915 Atlantic Monthly article, the African roots of war. He pinpointed the origins of the conflict in the competition amongst the European belligerents for imperial control of Africa and its people. France, England, and Belgium all had blood on their hands. But thirsty for global domination, Germany, in Du Bois's opinion, posed a grave threat to the world's darker races. The Allies had to win. So when Woodrow Wilson addressed Congress on April 2nd, 1917, and declared war on Germany, 
Du Bois, unlike many of his socialist friends in and outside of the NAACP, was not opposed to the United States entering the conflict. He argued that it presented an opportunity for African Americans to stake claim to their citizenship and bring meaning to Wilson's claim that the world must be made safe for democracy. Black people had fought in the past and now they would do so again with hopes that the two warring ideals of being black and being American that he famously articulated in the souls of black folk would at last be reconciled. Du Bois threw himself into the war effort, encouraging African Americans as soldiers and as civilians to demonstrate their loyalty on and off of the battlefield. But white supremacy tested his patriotism. Along with other African Americans, he had to reckon with moments like the unjust execution of 13 soldiers following a racial shootout in Houston, Texas, and especially the East St. Louis pogrom of July 1917, which left hundreds of black people dead. While African Americans certainly pleaded for Woodrow Wilson to make America safe for democracy, they also demanded it, as evidenced by the silent protest parade in response to the East St. Louis massacre, with the boys marching in the front, always had his cane in hand. So when Joel Spinger, former chairman of the NAACP and one of Du Bois's closest friends, approached him in early June of 1918 with an offer to become a captain in the Army's war, excuse me, in the War Department's military intelligence division, a captain in the War Department's military intelligence division, Du Bois had a momentous potentially career-defining choice to make. He knew that this appointment would arouse suspicions, but he believed in a letter that he wrote to the Director of Military Intelligence that his decision to accept the offer reflected no inconsistency with or change of attitude from my lifelong work and opinions. Indeed, he viewed his attitude as, quote, one of far-reaching patriotism. Just to make sure no lingering reservations existed about his loyalty, he wrote close ranks for the July issue of the crisis. The Great War represented the crisis of the world, Du Bois began. He argued that however distant the war seemed, black people had, quote, no ordinary interest in the outcome. For this reason, African Americans had to make their allegiances clear. Let us, while this war lasts, forget our special grievances and close our ranks shoulder to shoulder with our own white fellow citizens and the allied nations that are fighting for democracy, Du Bois declared. We make no ordinary sacrifice, but we make it gladly and willingly with our eyes lifted to the hills. Close ranks unleashed a firestorm of controversy. The Boston civil rights activist and one-time ally, William Monroe Trotter, labeled Du Bois, among other insults, a rank quitter of the fight for rights. From coast to coast, in newspapers, barbershops, many African Americans branded Du Bois as self-serving at best, and at worst, a traitor to the race. For a man who had committed his life to the cause of freedom and justice for black people, no charge could be more hurtful. The captaincy offer ultimately crumbled, but the uproar and damage to his radical credentials left Du Bois deeply scarred. Du Bois' attempt to strike a grand bargain with the federal government and American democracy seemed yet more misguided in light of the US military's treatment of black servicemen. Approximately 380,000 African American soldiers served in the racially segregated U.S. Army. The majority of black troops in France unglamorously labored in the services of supply, loading and unloading ships, digging ditches, laying railroad tracks, burying dead bodies. The Army reluctantly agreed to the creation of two black combat units, the 92nd Division, 
composed of draftees and the 93rd Division, made largely of National Guardsmen. While the 93rd Division compiled a stellar combat record, the 92nd Division became, as Du Bois later described it, the storm center of the Negro troops. Racist white commanders and deliberate neglect from the War Department doomed the performance of the division from the start, while its black officers, Du Bois's shining examples of talented 10th manhood and racial leadership, endured humiliation after humiliation. African Americans could certainly point to several notable battlefield triumphs and moments of racial pride. But for most black soldiers, the war for democracy that Du Bois had so enthusiastically championed devolved into a personal hell. As the end of the war neared, Du Bois, his credibility tattered, his leadership in question, sat in the most precarious position of his otherwise illustrious career. Then, quite unexpectedly, an opportunity presented itself one that would profoundly impact Du Bois' life for the next two decades. At the October 1918 Board of Directors meeting, the NAACP proposed that Du Bois spearhead production of a book on the history of the black experience in the war. He leapt at the opportunity. The scholar in Du Bois was intrigued, but more important here was a chance for redemption. As a way of demonstrating his continued ability to organize and lead, he envisioned the book as a collaborative effort. He had two co-authors in mind, Carter G. Woodson, founder of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History and the creator of Black History Month, and Emma J. Scott, former secretary to Booker T. Washington, who had recently served as a special assistant to the Secretary of War in the War Department. But Du Bois's influence had its limits. Woodson, arguably the most prominent African-American historian in the nation, next to Du Bois, insisted on receiving sole credit for the project. Scott, arguably the most influential African-American in the government during the war, had plans to write his own book. At stake was the right to call oneself the historian of the black experience in the war and the leadership stature that went along with it. This was a fight that Du Bois had to win. Undaunted, he set his sights on France, where, as he would later write, and I quote, the destinies of mankind center. On December the 1st, 1918, Du Bois boarded a ship, departed from Hoboken, New Jersey, as part of the official press delegation accompanying President Woodrow Wilson to the peace conference at Versailles. Du Bois spent three months in France. He organized a landmark Pan-African Congress in February of 1919. His principal mission, however, was to conduct research for the NAACP war history. He toured the battlefields and saw the trenches where soldiers of the 92nd Division fought until the 11th hour on November the 11th as the armistice went into effect. He visited the encampments and experienced, as he recalled, a touch of war, even put on a helmet. Most important, he talked with black soldiers and officers. With military intelligence following his every move, Du Bois absorbed tale after tale of discrimination, slander, and abuse inflicted upon black servicemen at the hands of the American army. A longtime friend, Matthew Virgil Boutet, served as his guide. Boutet was a captain in the 92nd Division who had been constantly humiliated by his fellow white officers, court-martialed, on false charges of inefficiency, seriously injured in combat, and placed despite his officer status in a segregated hospital ward with regular enlisted men. He entrusted his diary to Du Bois, where in one pain entry he scrawled, no nation on earth has ever hated a group as the Americans hate Negroes. Never in my life have I heard such an astounding series of stories? Du Bois wrote from France in a January 1919 letter to his NAACP colleagues. You have not the faintest conception of what these men have been through. It is not only astonishing, but it will arouse every ounce of sympathetic blood in your veins. He knew what needed to be done. The task ahead was clear. His commitment had been steeled. <clears throat> 
I can say solemnly and without hesitation, he declared, the greatest and most pressing and most important work for the NAACP is the collection, writing, and publication of the history of the Negro troops in France. Du Bois returned to the United States enraged, embarrassed, and determined. He cannot help but to question if his decision to encourage black people to throw body and soul into the war effort had been worthwhile. He channeled his frustrations along with the anguish of African American servicemen he encountered in France into the post-war issues of the crisis. In the May 1919 issue, he informed readers about his mission in France, exposed the racism of the US Army, and defended the honor of black troops. The highlight, however, was returning soldiers. As his words in this editorial would serve as a rallying cry for African Americans in the aftermath of the war, we return, we return from fighting, we return fighting. History would be Du Bois's central battleground in the struggle over the meaning of the war. Most American Negroes do not realize that the imperative duty of the moment is to fix in history the status of our Negro troops. He wrote in an editorial announcing his plans to produce the study of the black experience in the war. To assist in this cause, he tasked readers of the crisis to, quote, help in the completion of this history. Elsewhere, he specifically asked black soldiers and officers to, quote, see that the editor of the crisis receives documents, diaries, and information such as will enable the crisis history of the war to be complete, true, and unanswerable. Letters, diaries, photographs, official military documents, and personal memoirs quickly flooded Du Bois's office. In a note to Du Bois detailing his battles with racism while overseas, Sergeant Charles Isom of the 92nd Division expresses pleasure that, quote, someone has the nerve and backbone to tell the public the unvarnished facts concerning the injustice, discrimination, and Southern prejudice practices by the white Americans against the black Americans in France. Du Bois promised that his book, tentatively titled The Negro in the Revolution of the 20th Century, would appear by the fall. Black veterans like Charles Isom hoped that Du Bois would tell their story. Du Bois intended to serve as their voice. Generating further excitement, Du Bois published an essay toward a history of the black man in the Great War, a tantalizing preview of the larger book he planned to write, and a preemptive strike against attempts to distort and marginalize African Americans in the history and memory of the war. He wrote, quote, there is not a black soldier who but is glad he went, glad to fight for France, the only real white democracy glad to have a new, clear vision of the real inner spirit of American prejudice. The day of camouflage is past. Du Bois' certainty would be severely tested throughout the summer of 1919. From Washington, D.C., to Chicago, to Phillips County, Arkansas, race riots and full-scale massacres exploded throughout the country. The number of lynchings skyrocketed. Black veterans found themselves quite literally fighting for their lives. James Weldon Johnson labeled these bloody months the Red Summer. The horror of the summer was seared into, Bois, into Du Bois's memory as he would remember 1919 as a year of, in his own words, extraordinary and unexpected reaction. Du Bois used his 1920 book, Dark Water, there's that book again, sorry, <laughs> to reflect on the war its appalling aftermath, and his own growing disillusionment. He minced no words. In the chapter titled The Souls of White Folk, Du Bois wrote, quote, let me say this again and emphasize it and leave no room for mistaken meaning. The World War was primarily the jealous and avarice struggle for the largest share in exploiting darker races. Du Bois also asked a remarkable question. How great a failure and a failure in what does the World War betoken? On both a personal and intellectual level, it was a question that he had to answer. Du Bois therefore committed himself to the NAACP war history. He devoted significant time throughout much of 1920 and into 1922, often writing late into the night, 
past his customary bedtime of 10 p.m., to drafting several potential chapters for what he confidently believed would be the definitive history of the black experience in the war. Still exhilarated from his Pan-African Congresses of 1919 and again in 1921, he wrote chapters on the experiences of black troops in the French and British armies, as well as a chapter ruminating on the future of the black world in the wake of the war. Du Bois's early chapter drafts also reflected an attempt to try and find redemptive value in the global catastrophe and his own place in it. This was clear in a chapter titled The Challenge, which summarized the difficult choices African Americans and himself faced in supporting the war. For a moment, and it was but a moment, it passed, but for a moment the country seemed to rise to its mightiest stature, he wrote. Addressing his disillusionment, he reflected, I have been called bitter. I am bitter. But here I saw all the hurts, the tears, the pain, as in one country, and that country was mine. Du Bois was glad that at least for this one brief, fleeting, emancipatory moment, he could call himself an American. And that he in the race, quote, could think with the nation and not as a mere group. We could rise to mighty selfishness, the nation, our country, the allies as champions of the little hurt folk, democracy. The only way that he could explain his delusion was to plead temporary insanity. We were mad. That is the only word for it. We were mad and let it not excuse us to say that the madness was divine. But he still refused to completely admit that he was wrong in supporting the war. How in the end did all this set with our inner problem, he pondered. After all, it was not a mere bargain, it was a moving wish. Du Bois pressed ahead to finish his book. He held out hope that despite a lack of financial support and numerous other commitments and distractions, future book projects, crisis editorials, speaking engagements, Pan-African Congresses, conflicts with other black leaders, it would soon be completed. But the worsening conditions facing African Americans and peoples of African descent throughout the diaspora caused him to further struggle with the war's individual and collective meaning. The walls of caste segregation seemed to only grow higher. Racial violence became more and more horrific. The grip of Europe on Africa, in spite of its Pan-African Congresses, only tightened. And then there was personal tragedy. In January of 1922, Du Bois lost his closest black friend and the man who best embodied the quest to reconcile race and country, Colonel Charles Young. Young was the highest ranking black officer in the army and black America's military hero. Think of Colin Powell before there was a Colin Powell. He had been unjustly retired from active service during the war for dubious health reasons to prevent him from becoming a general. It broke his heart. The army conveniently reinstated him after the armistice and assigned him to Liberia. He would die in a Nigerian hospital. Over a year after his death, Young's body was finally returned to the United States and buried with full honors in Arlington National Cemetery. But Du Bois cannot forgive the government for the quote, these are his words, inexcusable crime of sending Young to Liberia. Quote, for if Charles Young's blood pressure was too high for him to go to France, Du Bois wrote in an editorial, why was it not too high for him to be sent to the even more arduous duty in the swamps of West Africa? God rest his sickened soul, Du Bois seethed but give our souls no rest if we let the truth concerning him droop, overlaid with lies. This ugly reminder of the war's legacy provided further validation for the new title Du Bois had given his book, The Black Man and the Wounded World. As the title reflected, Du Bois' initial conceptualization of the war as a potentially revolutionary moment in the reconstruction of global race relations had evolved to an interpretation of the conflict as one of the darkest moments in modern world history. The war was a global tragedy. 
This sense of the war as tragic was not solely about the incredible loss of life and physical destruction. For Du Bois, it also had to do with the strengthening of white supremacy and continued economic exploitation of peoples of African descent. No surprise then that he described the war in the opening chapter of his book manuscript as, quote, a scourge in evil, a retrogression to barbarism, a waste, a wholesale murder. Du Bois's public announcement in 1924 of the black man in the wounded world sparked renewed public interest in his book. Encouraged, he began to write again. By 1926, he had drafted the bulk of his envisioned chapters. The book finally seemed on the verge of completion. But he needed help. He had a massive manuscript that judged by his high scholarly standards still required significant work. Without time and editorial assistance, he felt that he could not adequately complete the project. So seeking support, he sent inquiries to nearly every major philanthropic organization, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Russell Sage Foundation, the Slater Fund, the Julius Rosenwald Fund, the Carnegie Endowment. All expressed courtesy interest in his book, but all ultimately offered their regrets. But beyond the practical obstacle of financial support, Du Bois faced an even bigger and more daunting challenge himself. If the war he had supported was indeed a failure, as he pondered as early as 1920, with no positive outcome, then perhaps his book, languishing and in limbo, was destined for a similar fate. Du Bois' sizable ego would not allow for this possibility. As he agonized over what to do with his book, many of the same veterans who had once viewed Du Bois as a savior now started to go restless and requested the return of the personal letters, photographs, memoirs, and other ephemera they had loaned to him so many years ago. One of them, James Johnson, a Harlem attorney and former sergeant, even threatened to take Du Bois to court. Facing the threat of a lawsuit and public humiliation, Du Bois found the time to locate Johnson's items and return them. But the majority of black veterans were not quite as fortunate. Du Bois may not have really felt all that guilty about his treatment of Johnson and other black veterans, but he certainly harbored guilt about his decision to support the war. In 1930, Du Bois participated in a published discussion for the magazine The World Tomorrow on the war guilt debate, if Germany was solely responsible for the war and if American intervention was justified. In his reply to the editor, he admitted to being quote, swept off my feet during the World War by the emotional response of America to what seemed to be a great call to duty. The cost had been immeasurably high. Instead of a war to end war or a war to save democracy, we found ourselves during and after the war descending to the meanest and most sordid of selfish actions. And we find ourselves today nearer moral bankruptcy than we were in 1914. Then surprisingly, but with a disclaimer, he actually admitted, I'm ashamed of my lack of foresight. And yet war is so tremendous and terrible a thing that only those who actually experience it can know its real meaning. Du Bois was willing to acknowledge his error in supporting the war, but still sought to rationalize his decision by casting himself as one of the war's countless victims. It was not his fault. Never content to remain unproductive, Du Bois turned to other projects, including his most notable published work of history, Black Reconstruction. The war, however, stayed on his mind. In a letter to Alfred Harcourt proposing Black Reconstruction in 1931, Du Bois informed the editor, quote, I'm going to add next year as a second volume, The Black Man and the Wounded World. That is the part which Negro troops took in the World War and its significance for the world today. Harcourt responded to Du Bois that the proposed study on Reconstruction, quote, promises a really interesting book. He made no mention of the book on the World War. Following the 1935 publication of Black Reconstruction, Du Bois again returned to the black man and the wounded world. A glimmer of hope appeared in March of that year when he secured a $600 grant from the Social Science Research Council. By this time, Du Bois's politics had moved further to the left, and he began to envision the black man and the wounded world 
as an explicit lesson about the horrors of modern warfare. A trip around the world in 1936 brought even greater clarity to the book's new significance. Thanks to a fellowship from the Oberlander Trust, Du Bois spent seven months abroad, first visiting Hitler's Germany during the Olympics, then China, and finally, Imperial Japan. He returned to the United States in December of 1936, having seen firsthand the seeds of the next world war. The need for his book could not have been more urgent. This was the moment. He wanted people to see that the still open wounds from the last world war, infected and festering, promised an even greater disaster in the near future. In his mind, it was now or never. Hoping to finally put the project, along with the memory of the war itself, behind him, Du Bois reached out to the American Philosophical Society in March of 1937. I began my work in this field as a conventional study of the Negro as a soldier in the World War, he wrote. But over time, he explained the whole theme has been expanding and developing in my mind, more especially since my trip around the world in 1936. He now conceived the book, quote, on a much broader and more important scale. If only he could have leisure an opportunity to finish this work, he pleaded, I think I can do something which will have influence on future knowledge with regard to war and colored people. He thought about $7,500 would be sufficient. The American Philosophical Society denied his request. He received one final rejection in March of 1940 from the Social Science Research Council, just as Hitler prepared for the German army to invade France. Du Bois disillusioned, disheartened with a second world war, a tragic reality, abandoned hope that he would finish and publish his book. Despite an investment of more than 20 years, despite a manuscript over 800 pages in length, The Black Man in the Wounded World, Du Bois's epic history of the black experience in the First World War would never see the light of day. So this could very well be the end of the story. But we are left with the question of why. First, and perhaps most glaring, I'm sure this is on many of your minds, why didn't Du Bois finish his book? Why didn't Du Bois finish The Black Man in the Wounded World? I believe that Du Bois suffered from intellectual shell shock when it came to writing about and rationalizing a war defined by its irrationality. In his semi-autobiographical 1940 book, Dusk of Dawn, he wrote, in my effort to reconstruct in memory my thought and the fight of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People during the World War, I have difficulty in thinking clearly. Now, for any of you who are just somewhat familiar with Du Bois, Du Bois having difficulty of thinking clearly, this is not the Du Bois we're familiar with. He will go on to lament that, quote, the whole history of the American Negro and other black folk in the World War has never been written. He recalled his time in France and the mass of documents he had collected over the years. They deserve publication, not simply as part of the Negro's history, but as an unforgettable lesson in the spiritual lesions, the spiritual lesions of race conflict during a critical period of American history. By the 1940s, it was clear that the spiritual lesions caused by the First World War had not healed. World War II confirmed the failure of World War I, as well as Du Bois's decision at the time to place his moral and political credibility on the line in encouraging black people to close ranks and support America and the Allies. Indeed, Du Bois's own wounds had not healed as well. In a 1941 letter, regarding his alma mater, Fisk University, possibly taking a position on American preparedness to enter World War II, Du Bois wrote, quote, I have lived through one period of deliberate and prolonged propaganda for war and partially succumbed to it until I really believed that the First World War was a war to end war and that the interests of colored people in particular were bound up in the defeat of Germany. I have lived to know better and my opposition to war under any circumstances has been immeasurably increased. 
but even up to the final years of his life, Du Bois still sought to understand why he had supported the war in the first place. I felt for a moment as the war progressed that I could be without reservation a patriotic American. Du Bois, in his 80s, wrote in an autobiography published posthumously in 1968. I'm not sure that I was right, but my intentions were. I did not believe in war, but I thought that in a fight with America against militarism and for democracy, we would be fighting for the emancipation of the Negro race. With the armistice came disillusion. That disillusion stayed with Du Bois until his death on August 23rd, 1963 in Accra, Ghana. The war consumed Du Bois. It confounded him. He could not make sense of it both as a personal and historical moment. He was un unable to muster the intellectual fortitude and, dare I say, the moral strength necessary to complete his book. His failure embodied the tragedy and failure of the war he struggled to write about. In this sense, the black man in the wounded world was Du Bois himself. But we are also left with the question of why does this story matter? Well, it matters because Du Bois matters. He remains arguably the greatest black intellectual this country has ever produced. And just as we rightly celebrate his genius, we must also understand his humanity. Someone who hoped and dreamed. Someone capable of making the wrong decision. Someone capable of failure. And someone who changed the failure of World War I and ultimately the failure to complete the black man in the wounded world were essential to his political evolution and radicalism. By the late 1940s, he became a staunch peace activist and in the eyes of the federal government in the midst of the Cold War, Red Scare, a threat. In 1951, he was indicted and tried by the federal government on charges of being an agent of a foreign principal. He won an acquittal, but the ordeal and subsequent seizure of his passport by the government were a painful reminder that for a black person criticizing America and fighting for peace came with tremendous risk and cost. In his book, In Battle for Peace, published in 1952, Du Bois wrote, quote, as then a citizen of the world, as well as a citizen of the United, uh, of the United States of America, I claim the right to know and think and tell the truth as I see it. I believe in socialism as well as democracy, he wrote. Above all else, Du Bois declared, I hate war. But I believe this story also goes beyond Du Bois. It reveals to us the impact of World War I on African Americans, how it exposed the core tensions of African American identity, and how it shaped the history of racial struggle in the 20th century and up to the present. For Du Bois, the history of World War I was not simply an intellectual challenge, it was a profoundly personal, moral, ethical challenge as well. It still is. Du Bois understood that the history of the war was deeply bound with the political status of black people, the future of democracy, and the condition of the world that we live in. It still is. More than a century, after the First World War, many of the same struggles Du Bois confronted, white supremacist violence, creeping fascism, wealth inequality, modern forms of voter disenfranchisement, the corrupting influence of money in the electoral process, right-wing assaults on the truth, exorbitant government spending on the military, preparedness for endless war. All of these issues remain urgent matters today. Du Bois, through his life, his work, and his voice, has tasked us with confronting our current sick democracy and working with all of our strength to heal our still wounded world. Thank you.